Okay, for those of you who are looking for the notes, uh, this lecture will follow rather closely lecture five of my GGI notes. So if you've downloaded those already, um, go to lecture five, which has the same title, the Goldstone Boson Equivalence Theorem, and you'll be able to follow along. Or afterward, it's fine. Okay, so in the previous two lectures, I've told you a little about the foundations of weak interactions, the experimental basis for the theory of weak interactions, and the precision electroweak experiments of the 1990s, and actually even the more recent ones on the measurement of the W mass. And told you that this picture of SU2 cross U1 for the weak interactions has a great deal of theoretical and observational coherence. There, what I wanted to do in this lecture is to talk about one of the subtleties of the SU2 cross U1 theory, which actually it comes up all the time, so it's worth understanding it well. And that is the nature of the longitudinal polarization state of the W boson. So this is, um, let me maybe state the problem in the following way. In the previous lecture, we wrote down the polarization vectors for left-handed, right-handed, and longitudinally polarized Ws in the rest frame of the W. And these were, um, so this is epsilon equals zero here, one over the square root of two, zero, one, minus I zero, and zero, 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 one. So this is just simple quantum mechanics, the vectors that represent the various states of spin one, S3 equals plus one, zero, and minus one. Now what I'd like to do is to boost these vectors so that I have a W with a momentum vector um, E00P. Zero, zero so I'm going to boost uh, very strongly in the end in the three direction. And the polarization vectors for this W boson are given just by the boosts of these vectors. And for the top and bottom ones, you can immediately recognize what they should be because the boost has no effect on a transverse vector. However, in the middle case, there's a surprise. Um, what you get is uh, P over MW, 0, 0, E over MW. And what's interesting is that this vector asymptotically, as the momentum gets large, becomes proportional to P mu over MW. That is to say, it's parallel to the momentum vector of the W boson. Now, all of these vectors over here and over here satisfy epsilon dot P equals zero. They have to be orthogonal to the momentum of the W boson. But remember, this is Minkowski geometry. So in Minkowski geometry, as a vector gets light-like, it can be uh, very close to another light-like, almost light-like vector and yet at the same time have zero dot product with it. So the dot product of these two in Minkowski geometry is zero. Nevertheless, there's some weirdness about this because this can potentially be a very large number. If you have a 1 TeV W boson, and uh, Michelangelo and his colleagues at the LHC see those all the time, uh, this number is uh, 10 or 12. And so that can be an enhancement of the amplitude and in the rate that can get squared. And let me just give you a, a simple example of this. And it's one that we'll come back to a little later in the lecture. If I imagine that I have a virtual photon that decays to a W plus W minus pair, the structure of this amplitude will be something like E epsilon of the W plus dotted into the epsilon of the W minus times K minus minus K plus mu. That is to say, there's a piece of the vertex. This is the whole Young-Mills vertex. But there's a piece of the vertex which is just like the coupling to a scalar particle times the product of the two polarization vectors. 
But if the polarization vectors are approximately P over MW, this thing is P plus dot P minus over MW squared, which is to say it's about one half S over MW squared. And then this is in the amplitude and it gets squared. So potentially you have a factor which is energy squared in the amplitude larger than what it can be. Now, for a scalar field, if you drop this factor, that's exactly consistent with unitarity in the S wave. So this contribution is going to violate unitarity unless we do something about it. So this is kind of, this is definitely weird. Um, this is definitely the correct polarization vector but it potentially gives effects that are on physical grounds much too large to expect. And the question, the next question is, well, maybe there's some way that these, this large number here, or which, get, which is present in the square here, maybe that always cancels. And the answer is that it doesn't always cancel. Sometimes the large factor appears, sometimes the large factor does not appear, and you have to know on physical grounds when that's going to happen and when it's not going to happen. And this enters many interesting processes at high energy, so it's something that we'd really like to understand very well. Now, what's the resolution of this? Well, it probably won't surprise you to, if I say that the resolution of this has to do with gauge invariance. Um, the gauge invariance and the compatibility of gauge invariance and massive vector bosons is, if you like, uh, very marginal. And it requires some special properties of the theory, in particular spontaneous symmetry breaking through the Higgs mechanism, in order to make those two things compatible. And so I think if you understand the role of these longitudinal W bosons, it's really that somehow encodes the physics of the Higgs mechanism in a way which is very interesting and important. And so I'm going to devote this entire lecture to the properties of these longitudinal W bosons. I'll give you first an example where this term doesn't cancel, and I'll explain the reason why. And then I'll give you an example where it does cancel, and I'll explain the reason why. And then there'll be another application that I hope is interesting to you. So maybe first I should talk about um, some properties of this term. So when you study the Higgs mechanism, you find out that uh, roughly you start with a massless vector boson. And the massless vector boson only has two polarization states, left and right. So this is what you find in electrodynamics. You solve Maxwell's equations, and there are only two polarization states for a propagating wave. The ones with, they always have transverse polarization, that is the E field is always transverse to the direction of motion. And you can write the two possible polarization states as left-handed and right-handed in states of definite angular momentum. Um, now, what you have to do in order to get a massive, so a massive boson necessarily has three polarization states because you can go to the rest frame and take one of the transverse polarization states and just rotate it by 90 degrees and now it has zero uh, three component of angular momentum so it's the longitudinal state. So another state has to be introduced. And the way that that's introduced, as one would explain to you the first time you see the Higgs mechanism, is you add the Higgs field. You spontaneously break the symmetry. The Higgs field gives up a Goldstone boson. Um, because the Higgs field before you gauge it has a continuous symmetry and that symmetry is broken, there must be a Goldstone boson. And then somehow the vector field eats the Goldstone boson and this is transmuted into the longitudinal component of the field. 
Now, when the vector boson is at rest, it's very unclear how to divide the three polarization states into two that are, if you like, primordial, and a third one which is, came from the Goldstone boson. But I hope you find it intuitive that when the vector boson is highly boosted, one can actually make this distinction. A very boosted particle resembles a massless particle. So I think it's natural to say that these two polarization states are mainly associated with the pieces that came from the original massless vector boson. But that means that this polarization state must have been the one that represents the Goldstone boson, which was eaten. Yes? Uh, this expression, if you just take that and you compute, let's say, E plus E minus to W plus W minus, it would violate S wave unitarity, yes. Uh, we're going to see what happens. You have to wait a little while. Okay. So, now, this has to do also with the subtlety of what gauge you work in when you do calculations in a spontaneously broken theory. In the feynman toft gauge, the vector boson propagator is something like this, minus i g mu nu over q squared minus m squared. And this has four polarization states. So in addition to a l, a r, and the longitudinal state, you add a time-like state. So this thing has four non-zero eigenvalues. The time-like state has negative norm. So it actually has negative probability. And the Goldstone boson is still around. And then uh, word identities or BRST word identities tell you that these things always cancel their contributions, but it's a very subtle cancellation. On the other hand, in unitarity gauge, a massive vector boson propagator has the following structure, q squared minus m squared, g mu nu minus q mu q nu over mw squared. And this quantity here is the projector onto the three physical polarization states. So this epsilon mu, epsilon nu with these three vectors adds up to this polarization tensor. And here again, you can see there's potentially a problem. Um, this thing is enhanced by the momentum squared over mw squared. And if that somehow gets caught when you compute the Feynman diagram, you're going to get an answer which is, you know, two, three, ten times larger than you expect. Now, Toft and Veltman proved that these two calculations always give the same result for gauge invariant quantities. But nevertheless, it's a little hard to see intuitively how that can possibly happen. So, People thought about this very hard. And so this is assisted by a very interesting result called the Goldstone boson equivalence theorem. So the Goldstone boson equivalence theorem was first enunciated uh, soon after the Toft and Veltman work by uh, Cornwall and Tiktopoulos and by Vianakis. And what they said was, there should be a theorem that makes manifest what I was saying about this correspondence over here. Namely, let me try and write this theorem. Let me write the theorem for a W plus very carefully. So let me imagine that I take my Higgs field and I write that as pi plus one over the square root of two V plus the Higgs plus I pi zero. So pi plus, pi minus, and pi zero are the three Goldstone bosons which are in the Higgs field of the standard model, and they're eaten when the W bosons get mass. 
And what uh, Cornwall, Tiktopoulos, and Vianakis said is there's a theorem in spontaneously broken gauge theory that says that if I want to calculate x goes to y with the emission or absorption of a very high energy W boson, which is longitudinally polarized, the amplitude for that is equal to the amplitude for x goes to y plus the emission of this now unphysical Goldstone boson up to corrections which are of order MW over the energy of the W. So I think you can see that this is quite non-trivial. This thing can have the P over M enhancement. This term here doesn't because it's a scalar emission. But nevertheless, the gauge invariance, the structure of the theory given by gauge invariance, should guarantee that this relation is true. So I'm not going to prove this theorem because the proof is rather technical. But if you'd like to see the proof, there's a very beautiful paper by Chanowitz and Gaillard. The reference is in the notes. Um, maybe I should just give you the date if you want to look it up. 1985. In which they kind of pull out the full structure of BRST and they prove this theorem for any number of W boson emissions um, in uh, the full renormalized SU2 cross U1 theory. Actually, in any renormalizable gauge theory. So this is a true theorem. And I want to try and explain it to you through some examples. So now what I'd like to do is to show you in some calculations how this correspondence works. Um, how we might or might not have an effect of this term and how we interpret that in terms of the emission of a Goldstone boson. So let me start with the simplest case, or a relatively simple case, which is the decay of the top quark. Now, in his slides, I think Michelangelo didn't quite get to this today, but in his slides, he gave you this as an exercise. But I didn't see the slides, so now I'm going to do the homework for you. So at least you can thank me for that. So let's think about the decay of the top quark. The top quark decays to a W boson and a bottom quark. This vertex here is the V minus A interaction. Uh, U dagger of B left, sigma mu U of T, epsilon star of the W boson. So that's the V minus A interaction that we've been talking about all week. Um, to get an accurate result, you should keep the bottom quark massive, but I'm going to uh, treat the bottom quark as massless, which is fine for what I want to tell you about. And um, that's going to make the calculation a lot easier. So the spinners, let's um, set up the top quark. So it's spinning in the plus three direction. So the UT left will be the upper component of this. Um, let me try and get the rest of this oriented correctly. Um, ah, please excuse me. Uh, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to take C and C here for an arbitrary spin direction. So it's just easiest if we let the W boson go along the three axis. The bottom quark go in the opposite direction and point the top quark spin in some relative orientation for which this angle is theta. And then um, u of t left is equal to the square root of mt. u left of t is the square root of mt times um, cosine theta over 2 sine theta over 2. So that's the effect of this rotation angle. 
and the u left of the b will be what you get for a left-handed particle going in the wrong direction. So it'll be the square root of 2 eb times 1, 0. OK, now we're all set. And now we just have to compute this um, matrix element, dot it with the W polarization vector, and we can calculate all of the helicity amplitudes. So our three choices for the W polarization vector are, unfortunately, the things that I erased. So let me not write them again. The right-handed, left-handed, or longitudinal polarization. OK. so. Let's now uh, calculate the helicity amplitudes for these decays. There are three of them because the top core can potentially go to a right-handed W boson, a left-handed W boson, or a longitudinal W boson. And so let's calculate those in order. So first of all, for the W right, We get Ig over the square root of 2, the square root of 2 mt times Eb from the product of these factors, A10, A1 uh, minus sigma, and um, cosine theta over 2, sine theta over 2. And then this thing dotted into the uh, right-handed polarization vector. So sigma dot that vector, um, it's in the final state, so I have to complex conjugate it. So that is going to give uh, 0, 0, 2, and 0, and 1 over the square root of 2. And so unfortunately, this doesn't have any overlap with that. And so for this process, we're going to get 0. For the W left, it's the other way around. The polarization vector, the epsilon star, is 1i0. So we're going to get this object. And now there's an overlap. And we're going to get then. Um, Ig over the square root of 2. There's a square root of 2, as you see here. There's a factor of sine theta over 2. And there's this factor of the square root of 2 mt eb. OK, and I think I actually got that right. OK. Now, finally, the longitudinal polarization vector. So sigma, one sigma dotted into the longitudinal polarization vector, which you remember is p over m, 0, 0, e over m, is going to be this matrix, um, p plus e over m. Oh, please excuse me. This is mu, mu. So there's an extra minus sign from the Lorentz metric when I dot this with this. P minus E over M, 0, 0. And now I have to take the matrix element of this thing between the spinners, which I wrote here. It's going to pick out this term. So I'm going to get I G over the square root of 2. There's no extra square root of 2. A 2 M T E B. Uh, P plus E over MW and the cosine of theta over 2. And so now we can uh, directly simplify this. If you just remember, again, the kinematics of a decay of a massive particle to a massive and a massless particle, the E of the, of the W is MT squared plus MW squared over 2 MT. The P, which is also the energy of the bottom quark, is mt squared minus mw squared over 2mt. So this factor here is actually um, mt squared minus mw squared, the square root of that. 
And this factor here, which is the sum of the energies of the W and the bottom quark, is the mass of the top quark. So this is uh, now developing in a somewhat interesting way. The three amplitudes have the following structure. They have an IG over the square root of two. Um, they have this factor of mt squared minus mw squared to the one half. And then for right, zero, and left, this is zero. This one is cosine theta over two, and it has an extra factor of mt over mw. This one is sine theta over two with the square root of two in front of it. Can I explain this pattern in terms of angular momentum? Well, most of the factors can actually be explained with angular momentum. The top quark, let's say, looks like this. And let's consider the forward production of a W boson. The bottom quark is always left-handed. So its spin points that way. Um, here, let, let me leave this ambiguous for the moment. The W, the spin, depends on what polarization state I pick. So oh, please excuse me, that way. So if I pick a right-handed W boson, this is J3 equals 3 halves, that plus that. So I can't produce that state from a spin a half object. So I get 0. That's the result of angular momentum. If I have a left-handed W, that's compatible with um, the left-handed spin of the top quark, the backward spin of the top quark and you get this sine theta over two distribution. That's perfect. And if I have a longitudinal W, then I get a forward W, so I get a cosine theta over two. So, so far so good, everything's working out. The only problem is this factor here, which I think is, um, at, le at least uh, it, naively, it's totally unexpected. So let's now just put this together. Um, the total width of the top quark is 1 over 2 mt, 1 over 8 pi, the integral d cosine theta over 2 of the amplitude squared. And when you work it through, you get the following result. Um, alpha over 16, alpha w over 16 pi the mass of the top quark, because um, there's the square of this factor, a 1 minus mt over mw squared. Oh, please excuse me. There's a 2p over mt from phase space. So you get one factor of this from the square of that. You get another factor of this from phase space. And then there's the following factor, mt over mw squared from this term and two from the left-handed polarization state. And I, I think I now got this completely right. Good. OK, now, what we expected was that the width of the top quark should be something like alpha w over something times the top quark mass. But what appeared is an extra factor of mt over mw squared. And that's a, a little of a surprise. Maybe um, if you'd done this calculation in another way, you would still have been surprised, but there would have been a different origin. Namely, if you'd used the polarization sum epsilon epsilon star, equals g mu nu minus q mu q nu over mw squared, you would have found out that, to your surprise, this thing didn't cancel, but instead it actually gave the largest term. And this thing would turn into this expression in the final rate. So the first question is, is this real? And the second question is, can we understand it? So first of all, I'd like, just like to say that this enhancement here, 
the enhancement of the longitudinal polarization state, is exactly what's predicted by the Goldstone boson equivalence theorem. Because the Goldstone boson equivalence theorem tells you that the production of a longitudinal W boson, the amplitude is equal to the amplitude for producing the Goldstone boson, which was eaten when the W boson became massive. But interestingly, this vertex here is g over the square root of 2. But this vertex is yt, the top quark Yukawa coupling. And this diagram is naturally enhanced over what you would naively expect for that one by yt over g over 2 in the rate it would be squared. That would be m top squared divided by g squared over 2. Sorry. Um, Sorry, yt squared. Now, m top is yt over the square root of 2, mw times v, gv over 2. So if I just put v squareds everywhere and then divide by 2, this is actually m top squared over mw squared. So the Goldstone boson equivalence theorem explains this enhancement of the longitudinal polarization state because the very fast W, the highly boosted W, which is emitted in top decay, when it's longitudinally polarized, it isn't really a W boson. It's really a Higgs boson. And a Higgs boson couples more strongly to the top quark than a W boson because it couples with the top quark Yukawa coupling instead of the SU2 coupling. And so in that way, the Goldstone boson equivalence theorem, well, first of all, tells you that this extra term, q mu q nu over mw squared, doesn't cancel out. It's actually the most important contribution. And it's a contribution that actually is essential to getting the right answer for this expression. OK, well, now the most interesting part. Is this actually correct observationally? Well, interestingly, it is because, and we can test it in the following way. You remember that in the previous lecture, I told you that you can measure the polarization of a W by looking at the direction of the lepton from the W in the W frame when it decays. For a right-handed W, so this is now the cosine of this angle. The, you go to the W frame. The W is moving this way. You boost it to rest. The lepton in that frame goes off this way, and you measure that angle. Um, the distribution is 1 plus cosine squared theta for a right-handed W, 1 minus cosine sorry, 1 minus cosine theta squared for a left-handed W and sine squared theta for a longitudinally polarized W. And so from this example, what you would predict is the following. The branching ratio for the top to go to a longitudinal W um, is mt squared over mw squared divided by mt squared over mw squared plus 2. And when you put in the numbers, that's about 70%. So if I made this distribution for the leptons from W bosons from top decay, then I should see a picture that looks like this. Mostly the central production, and then just a bit over here from the left-handed production. So that's what that function should look like. The zero here is the absence of a right-handed coupling. So pure V minus A, there's no right-handed part of the coupling in the original Lagrangian. If there were a right-handed coupling, so I could produce B rights, then uh, I would get something over here. So the zero is equal to the absence of B right 
in this decay. Okay, now let's look at the data. So in the Tevatron and the LHC experiments, you can collect top quark events. Here's a very beautiful top quark event uh, collected by Atlas. Um, top quark pair production events are especially straightforward to analyze. So in this case, there's one top quark which is going up, which is decayed to three jets, and there's an anti-top quark going down, which is decayed to a B jet, a W, which is decayed to an electron, and a neutrino. And so um, what you see is the B this jet coming down actually has a B tag of the kind that I talked about in the last two lectures. Up top, it's resolved into three jets. And so it's, uh, this is the kind of signature that you're interested in for top quark production. Actually, if you look at it in the um, theta versus uh, rapidity plane, uh, that's the picture given here. Unfortunately, it's upside down. I don't know why they did that. Um, I know who to blame, but I won't tell you. Um, you see uh, the, the dots are the um, calorimetric energy in the uh, phi versus rapidity plane. And you see there are three jets, which corresponds to the one up there, and then one jet and the lepton candidate, which is shown at the top. Um, is there a better, yeah, this is a better view of it. Um, okay, so now what's interesting about this event is that we basically measure everything but the neutrino. If we have an idea that this is a top quark pair production event, um, then the neutrino, there's a lot of uh, information that we have to reconstruct the neutrino. Because the lepton and the neutrino have to sum to the W mass, we measure the missing energy, so we know already the transverse momentum of the neutrino. The electron and the neutrino have to sum to the W mass, and the whole thing has to sum to the top quark mass. So I think you can see that from the information given, you can reconstruct all the four vectors, do the transformations, go to this frame, and measure this distribution. And so let me show you a couple pictures of distributions measured in this way. Here's the one from the Tevatron. And you see it roughly has this structure, although maybe um, the resolution leaves something to be desired. Here's the one from the LHC. And uh, oh, please excuse me. I didn't, maybe I didn't draw it right. This is totally symmetrical. There's a contribution like this, so it should look like that. And with some smearing, you can see that that's exactly the structure that you find. I'm sorry, there is a non-zero probability here to um, have cosine theta equals plus one, but that's entirely due to detector resolution. And if you take the curve there and smear it with the detector resolution of Atlas, you get the histogram to which the data is fitted. So really, one can directly measure these W polarizations and show that this number is indeed realized in the experiments to a couple percent accuracy at this point. OK. Well, this is incredibly cool because now we've seen an example where um, the the extra term, this enhancement that comes from the, uh, the propagator of the polarization sum of W bosons, including the longitudinal polarization state, actually gives an enhancement in the amplitude. However, the next thing I have to tell you is this doesn't always happen. And there are times when you have to actually cancel this enhancement. And probably the, the one which is easiest to understand is the one that I started with down here on the blackboard, which was the case of E plus E minus to W plus W minus. So let's go back and think about that case in a little more detail.
So E plus E minus to W plus W minus is generated by this Feynman diagram, but of course it's not the only one. One can also have a Feynman diagram which involves virtual Z exchange. And there's also a diagram where you have virtual neutrino exchange like this. So actually the full amplitude is given by the sum of these three diagrams. And that's the thing that we should now try to understand. So let me consider first the case which is a little easier, which is if I have a right-handed electron beam, then the right-handed electron doesn't couple to the W in the neutrino, and this diagram is absent. And I just have to consider the sum of these two diagrams. Now, each of these diagrams individually gives a result which is in the amplitude S over MW squared larger than you would expect. I already proved that to you. So now what I'd like to ask is what happens when you take these two diagrams and add them together? Is there some mysterious conspiracy which is going to cause these terms to cancel? So, Let's try and work this out pretty carefully. So there's a minus IE for the photon diagram, um, an IE which comes from this vertex. Um, 2 times the square root of 2 times um, P, the uh, momentum in the initial state, times the right-handed polarization vector of P. So that's just uh, this vertex here. Um, 2 times the square root of 2 times the square root of 2e electron is what should appear there. And then there's a minus i over s. And then there's a, the Young-Mills vertex, which is epsilon minus dot epsilon plus um, k minus minus k plus um, plus epsilon minus star minus Q minus K minus dot epsilon plus plus epsilon plus star mu uh, Q plus K plus dotted into epsilon minus. So that's the full structure of the vertex that you get from Young-Mills theory. Remember it has three terms which have basically this structure. And now what I'd like to do is to evaluate this expression using the polarization vectors for extremely boosted longitudinal W bosons. So now I'm going to consider these W bosons as longitudinally polarized. And I'm going to put in epsilon 0 minus is equal to um, K minus over MW. And epsilon 0 plus is equal to K plus mu over mw. And so for this, I'm going to get as before 2s over mw squared. So that's the thing that I had before, which was dramatically enhanced. And um, actually, when you work it all out, the the result of all of those diagrams is also proportional to this structure. It's uh, S over, oh, sorry, not 2S, S over 2MW. It turns out that these terms are equal to minus double that. So it, it turns out to be minus S over MW squared, uh, but still with this uh, funny enhancement, which, uh, yes, is unitarity violating. However, what's interesting is the structure of this diagram. Remember, this is now an E right. So 
that diagram has the following structure. It has a 1 over um, q squared minus mz squared. Sorry, 1 over, in this terminology, s minus mz squared. And now you have to get all the factors right in this expression. There's a, a minus sw squared for the divided by cw squared, sw squared, for, sorry, divided by cw, sw. So this is the z coupling of the right-handed electron. And then if you ask what this vertex is, it has a factor cw over sw. And all of this is very cool because what you see is that all these factors cancel. There is a leftover minus sign. And so these two expressions cancel asymptotically in S. And so at the end of the day, what you end up with is something which is of order mz squared over S squared for that expression, for that expression plus higher orders. And so interestingly, this S squared cancels, the additional factor of S here cancels the numerator factor of S here, and we get something with the usual dependence. And when you work out all the details, what you find is that this is equal to um, minus I E squared uh, 2E of the electron, an extra factor of root 2, epsilon right of p dot k minus minus k plus, uh, which is now exactly the amplitude for producing a scalar particle, oh, sorry, times 1 over s. So that's now the amplitude for producing a scalar particle. And then there's an extra factor that um, Now, let, let me just rem Oh, I'm sorry. I left out something. These MWs I didn't keep. So there, oh yes, there's an MW squared. So there's an M Z squared over MW squared. which factor then becomes uh, 1 over cosine squared theta w. Good. Now, why is that a good thing? Well, let's think about the process that this is related to by Goldstone boson equivalents. It would be the following process, where I take a right-handed electron annihilated on a left-handed positron, there's a gamma plus Z star, and I produce a pair of Goldstone bosons, pi minus pi plus. In the high energy limit, I can actually even evaluate this more simply by remembering that I can change the basis in the high energy limit to SU2 and U1. And so I could equally well write this as linear combinations of A3 and B. But the right-handed electron doesn't couple to A3. It only couples to B. So in fact, the diagram simplifies to one with a single exchange, which would be an exchange of a U1 gauge boson, which it doesn't matter whether it's massive or massless because we're at very high energy. And then I'd just like you to remember that both of these couplings are 1 over E over CW, which is G prime. And that actually explains the complete structure that we have here. The QED scalar production, 1 over S, and the 1 over CW squared is just the product of the extra factors in these couplings. So how that works, it's like magic. But that it has to work, that's guaranteed by gauge invariance. 
And in the end, what you find is that the sum of these two diagrams for a right-handed electron is just exactly equal asymptotically to this diagram, which is the production instead of W's of the Goldstone bosons that the W's were supposed to have eaten when they became massive. Okay, now what happens when you do this with the electron left? Well now this cancellation doesn't occur because there's an extra term here, um, a half minus sine squared theta W. So that a half term doesn't cancel out. But in the notes it's explained that that extra half is canceled by this diagram. And so in the end it works out again that the unitarity violating terms all magically cancel. Now unfortunately the simple approximation that I used here is not sufficient in the left-handed electron case to compute the next term which would verify that even for a left-handed electron, so for a left-handed electron we would want to show the following that the set of three diagrams is proportional to um, a three plus b left-handed electron and pi minus pi plus. But let me just say that if you use the exact expression for the longitudinal polarization states and you get a very big piece of paper, you can work it out and it works perfectly. So um, I, I encourage you to do that, but um, it's not a five minute exercise. It's a, it's a serious exercise to get the next term. But at least the cancellation, you can see very clearly of this term against the effect of this diagram using this approximation. Okay, well once again, there's, we can ask the question, what does experiment have to say about this? So actually there is experimental data relevant to this question because at LEP, the energy of the accelerator was increased to 200 GeV, actually in the end to 208 GeV, and they actually observed this process, E plus E minus to W pairs. Actually here is an event where um, what you see are two jets from one W. Uh, this is interpreted as a, a pion from a tau, maybe a rho from a tau, um, with the other W decaying to tau nu. And uh, let's see, on the next slide, I think I have a four jet event from uh, W pair production in which both Ws decay hadronically. So uh, LEP2 observed a large sample of E plus E minus the W pair events over a range of energy. And they were able to actually take the sum of these diagrams, actually even the one loop electroweak radiative corrections were provided, and compare that to the rates measured in their experiment. The result is really interesting, and here it is. So the, the, error, the things with error bars are the data. The blue curve is the standard model prediction which incorporates this so-called unitarity cancellation. So the standard model prediction goes to, if there were only S wave, it would, it would peak and go down again. Um, the fact that this diagram has higher partial waves causes the cross section to slowly increase logarithmically. So that's what you see with the blue curve. And these things, uh, YFS, WW, and Raccoon are programs that incorporate the one loop electroweak corrections. But if you computed this at the tree level, the curve you would get would be very similar. On the other hand, if you leave out this diagram, you get the purple curve here. And let me just, yeah, if you leave out this diagram, you get the purple curve which is wide, wildly discrepant from the data and is heading upward in a direction that clearly violates S-channel unitarity. And if you leave out both of these diagrams, you get the blue curve, which is even worse. So one can say then that the cancellation, which 
seems extremely weird and magical when you actually do it with Feynman diagrams is verified experimentally. If you are a theorist, you would say, well, that cancellation had to happen because of the goldstein boson equivalence theorem. Whatever mess you get over there at high energy, it has to turn into this or this. So it's interesting. This goldstein boson equivalence theorem allows you to intuit when you get a large effect from this longitudinal uh, W polarization vector and when those effects have to cancel. You just replace the longitudinal Ws by the Goldstone bosons that they ate. Think about that process. All of a sudden, everything becomes much simpler. And you can see your way through it. And let's just say there are many examples of high energy physics. And as we go to higher energies at the LHC, there'll be more and more where this kind of thinking is going to be just tremendously valuable to you. OK. I have another 15 minutes. And I'd like to discuss one more topic which is relevant to this and which is uh, quite interesting for LHC physics. And that is, I'd like to discuss the uh, parton splitting functions for the W. Now, Michelangelo in his lectures talked about the parton splitting functions for quarks, namely a quark can uh, if you have some hard reaction that involves a quark, the quark can, from the initial or final state, radiate a gluon. And what he showed you is that when the gluon becomes collinear with the quark, there's a logarithmic enhancement of the cross section. And that's given by these uh, d GLAP or alter parisi splitting functions. There's some alpha s over pi. Uh, dPt squared over Pt squared, dz, where z is the momentum fraction of the quark carried away by the gluon, 1 plus uh, z squared over z. There's a color factor of 4 thirds. And so one gets an expression like this for the probability that a quark will radiate a gluon on the way in, or actually the same probability that the quark will radiate a gluon on the way out as the first stage of forming the jets that Michelangelo was talking to you about in this morning's lecture. Now, if you have a really energetic quark, then that quark can radiate a W boson and then go off and participate in some hard process. Actually, another thing that we're going to be very interested in is that instead of the quark going off to participate in a hard process, the W can go participate in a hard process. And in fact, if you have another quark over here, so this is, let's say, an up quark, which turns into a down quark, and a down quark, which turns into an up quark, you can have W plus W minus that you radiate off the quarks. These things can then collide and give you a W plus W minus scattering process. This process is called W fusion. It's extremely important in Higgs phenomenology because one of the things that you can have here, as we'll discuss in the next lecture, is W plus W minus coming together and creating through this vertex a Higgs boson. So one would really like to know what is the parton distribution of a W in the proton in the language that Michelangelo was using. And that'll be generated by the splitting of a W, an almost collinear W from the quark. Well, now there's an, an interesting question that one can ask. What is the polarization of the W, which is radiated from a light quark, a U quark or a D quark? Now, certainly, if you think about very high energy, you ignore all the masses. A W, aside from the fact that it's SU2 rather than SU3, would be just like a gluon. You would radiate a transversely polarized guy. Um, it would probably have the same kind of distribution function that you would have for a gluon. Um, the problem with that is 
that the Higgs boson, which is a, after all a Higgs boson, couples mainly to longitudinally polarized Ws. Because these are the things that in the high energy limit are equivalent to the um, pieces of the Higgs sector that the W absorb to become massive. And so a very interesting question is, is it possible for an up quark, which is a very light quark, to radiate a longitudinal W, which is then present in the structure of the proton and available for a collision with a longitudinal W coming from the other side. Naively, you would say this is zero because you use the Goldstone boson equivalence theorem. What appears here is the up quark Yukawa coupling, and that's suppressed by something like m up over v, which is a number which is 10 to the minus 5, and then you square it. However, it turns out that this is not right. And this was clarified in another beautiful 1985 paper by Sally Dawson. And basically, the reason it's not right is because the W emission process should really be viewed in the closer to the rest frame of the W, where the polarization states are more, um, more difficult to distinguish. And so let me just sketch that calculation for you. And in the end, we'll come to the splitting functions for the various polarizations of Ws that come from emission from a quark line. Um, I think Michelangelo uh, is a, like a real QCD calculator. And so he's used to using very automatic methods to generate QCD amplitudes. And these are very much like QCD amplitudes. Um, I'm more of an amateur in this field. So I'm just going to use these stupid helicity methods. But maybe it's, it's a little easier to understand. So let's sketch the calculation in the following way. I'd like to consider um, an incoming quark with momentum P, a W boson going off with momentum Q. And so this is, let's say, an up quark. This is a W plus. A down quark going off with momentum K. The W is going to be viewed as approximately collinear with the um, up quark to try and give some kind of enhancement of the production rate. So let me make approximations which are relevant to that situation. So let's now write the momentum vectors as follows. P, which is the on-shell um, momentum of the initial quark is E, E, E. Q carries away a momentum fraction Z. So Z is between 0 and 1. Um, it'll have some uh, transverse momentum. I'm going to make that in the one plane. So uh, this component will be 0. This component here will be ZE. And there'll be some correction to that, which I'm going to write in a moment. K, by energy conservation, has 1 minus Z here. By momentum conservation, it'll have the opposite PT. Here I have a 1 minus z, but it's got to be on shell. So the first correction to that will be um, pt squared divided by 2 times 1 minus z times e. So now to order uh, pt squared, um, this momentum is on shell at zero mass. And now for reasons of energy conservation, um, I have to write the opposite here, namely plus pt squared over 2 times 1 minus z times e. And this guy is off shell, but please notice in this diagram that guy is off shell uh, because it's in an immediate state of some more complicated Feynman diagram. Okay, okay now. What is the propagator in this Feynman diagram? It's 1 over q squared minus mw squared. So that's equal to um, 1 over minus pt squared. And then um, 
minus pt squared, then the square of this four vector gets another term. It's minus pt squared over one minus z and um, minus mw squared. So it's uh, space-like as the kinematics requires. And when you put it all together, it is uh, pt squared plus, sorry, over 1 minus z plus mw squared. Sorry, did I get that right? Oh, um, oh, sorry, z times this puts a z here. Yeah, now I got it right. Okay, very good. So now we're in excellent shape. Now I've got all the kinematics straightened out. Now I just have to compute the amplitudes. And that's pretty straightforward. Let's see. Time is running out. Maybe I just need to sketch the calculation of these amplitudes. The details are all in the notes. The matrix element is uh, um, I G over root two, the U for um, K, uh, sigma mu, these are all left-handed particles, U for P dotted into epsilon star of Q. Now, uh, for these elements, I just take the relevant polarization vectors. So U of P is a left-handed uh, quark polarization vector, 2P, two e, two actually, times 0, 1. Uh, U of k is 2P um, times 1 minus z. That's the energy of that particle, um, times a rotated polarization vector. So it's 1 here, but up here it's PT divided by 2 times 1 minus z times e. Um, you rotate through a half angle. So that's the origin of this factor of two. And then the polarization vectors for the W are um, one over the square root of two, zero, one, I, zero. But now you have to, again, rotate the W into its correct or orientation. So that will give here a factor of uh, pt over z times e and sorry it's minus and here um, q over mw pt over mw zero uh, Z E over M W. So this is the um, okay. so that's the rotated. Um, I, I guess I left out a Z here. That's the rotated longitudinal polarization vector. Okay, so now um, put this, this, this into here and crunch a little and out come the following results. The matrix elements are IG, the various cases are um, left, right, and zero. They're in a different order, please excuse me. Um, here you get the square root of 1 minus z. And here it turns out you only have to work to first order in pt. So that's all I'm going to do. Uh, pt over um, z times 1 minus z. Here you get the square root of 1 minus z times pt over z times 1 minus z. And there's an extra 1 minus z that appears in the numerator. And down here, you get minus 1 over the square root of 2, the square root of 1 minus z, times mw divided by z. 
So it turns out that you get non-zero results for all three entries. Um, this one, when you combine it with phase space and square it, will give you something analogous to this factor one that appears here. This one, the uh, right-handed uh, longitudinal, has an extra factor of one minus z. So it'll give the one minus z squared here. So for a left-handed quark radiating a gluon, this is the left-handed gluon, this is the right-handed gluon. And then there's going to be a, also a contribution from the longitudinal polarization state. And now let, let me just try and write um, more explicitly what this uh, works out to be. So let's consider a process, which is the one I was discussing before, where the quark comes in, the quark goes out. There's a virtual W here that collides with something X on this side and turns into Y. And by suitably manipulating the cross-section, you can then get the following formula. That sigma of qx goes to qy is approximately, in this collinear limit, equal to um, the integral dz, the integral uh, d2pt, um, there is a pt squared because here there are pt squared. Let, let me leave that aside for the moment. There's a numerical factor and there's the denominator which I wrote over there. Uh, pt squared divided by 1 minus z uh, plus mw squared squared. Then what comes here are the squares of these amplitudes. Um, there will be a, basically a pt squared and a one and some factors of z. Um, there will be a pt squared times one minus z squared and some factors of z. And for the longitudinal part, there'll be an mw squared divided by z squared. So, now, when you simplify this expression, the following thing is going to happen. Over here, we had a logarithmically divergent integral, pt squared over pt squared. So what you get is a logarithmic distribution of pts for the transverse parts. And you see that that's also forming over here. It's dpt squared times pt squared over asymptotically pt to the fourth. And so once again, this is a logarithmic distribution of the integrals. But for the case of the um, longitudinally polarized, we only get mw squared. So the pt is limited, the integral is finite. And so that eventually is the end of the story. Uh, what we're going to get is, uh, oh, and sorry, all of this times the cross section for x uh, for w plus x going to y. And so when you simplify this and clean up all the numbers, which is done in the notes, what you find is that this is equal to the integral dz of a w parton distribution in the proton times the cross section for w at the momentum zp uh, plus x going to y where the parton distributions are given by the following expressions. Fw of z is equal to um, alpha w over 4 pi for the left-handed case the integral b dpt squared times pt squared over um, pt squared plus one minus z times mw squared. 
And then the rest of it is the alteri parisi form, 1 over z. Here, alpha w over 4 pi dpt squared pt squared, sorry, squared over pt squared plus 1 minus z and w squared times an extra 1 minus z squared over z. So that's exactly analogous to what we found for the gluon case. And then for the longitudinal case, a somewhat different structure, alpha w over 8 pi times the integral dpt squared times mw squared divided by this denominator. times 1 minus z squared, it turns out, over z. Okay. Well, very interesting. These two expressions have logarithmically divergent distribution. So there's a logarithmic uh, distribution of PTs that goes out as far as you like. When the PT gets really large, we're in the regime where the Goldstone boson equivalence theorem applies. You can't radiate a longitudinal uh, w boson out there. But when the PT is small and comparable to MW, you're in the situation where it's like you're in the W rest frame and you get a non-zero result. And in fact, you can actually do this integral. And what you find is a distribution of longitudinal momenta Fw of z is alpha w over 8 pi times 1 minus z over z. So that's the longitudinal distribution of longitudinal, uh, longitudinal in the sense of uh, the beam axis, longitudinal in the sense of polarization states of w's in the proton. It's not enhanced, but it's order alpha w, so it's plenty big. And then one has some fuel to provide W fusion reactions at a high energy proton collider like the LHC. Um, the transverse momentum associated with this function is a transverse momentum which is strictly of order MW because, as I say, this is a convergent integral for large PT. And so using this function or maybe some more exact computation, one can then work out the rates of W fusion processes and try and use this um, uh, to compute the rates of reactions. What's especially interesting is that this is the longitudinal W, which is the equivalent of the Goldstone boson eaten by the W. So this is literally a Higgs sector reaction. Two particles from the Higgs sector coming together in a high energy collision to form presumably anything else that exists in the Higgs sector. And so this is a tremendous tool to be exploited at the LHC and at higher energy proton colliders. Um, we just raised the energy of the LHC, so now we can see how many of these reactions we can collect. Certainly they already are shown to produce Higgs bosons, and maybe at higher energy they'll produce surprises as well. So that's the end of today's lecture. Thank you very much.